Thank you so much for joining us today for the Pastor's Potluck Podcast. Here on the Pastor's Potluck, it's similar to a normal potluck where you might get something that you want and there may be something that you just want to pass up altogether. And that's okay. There's something here for everybody. Our goal here is to encourage you and maybe in the process entertain you. If you're ready, let's dig in. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is so good to see you here for another episode of the Pastor's Potluck Podcast. My name is Jared, uh, and today we have Pastor Scott with us here again. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. This is going to be coming out on Christmas Eve. Yep. So we're going to be having our Christmas Eve service today at 3 o'clock. If you're listening to this, if you're an avid listener and can't wait till every Friday morning, and so you're already listening to this, you are invited to our Christmas Eve service today um, at 3 p.m. But yeah, yeah. it's uh, I'm excited every time I get to sit down and be on the podcast um, just to try to, we just we just finished praying. Um, this very thing that I, I hope that this is helpful. I just hope that it's helpful. Like that's that's one of the main things I hope my ministry in life is is just helpful to other people. Yep. Um, so the way, if I can be helpful, then I'll know that it's it's ultimately not about me. It's not about you or anything else. It can be about Jesus helping other people. So that's what I hope we get to do today. Even though I think we're going to have a lot of fun today too. Yeah. Uh, it's really awesome. We ran some numbers and, uh, it's just really awesome to see everybody just kind of taking this content in and it's literally from people that, uh, that, you know, we've got a, a couple people that listen in Germany, which is kind of crazy. Um, we've got, uh, just people all like literally scattered all over the world and, um, you, you've all just been so supportive with the words that, um, y'all give us each and every single week whenever y'all see us or you reach out to us. Yeah. And so thank you so much for just watching. And, yeah. um, yep, let's get into it today. Um, we are going to be discussing uh, Christmas myths. Or if you wanted to say it like Mike Tyson, you could say Chris myths. You could. <laughs> Chris myths. <laughs> Um, that'd be a good sermon series title, Chris Myths. Yeah. Um, I actually have wanted to do this sort of content as a sermon series, and it just was... I haven't been able to put it together in a way that I could preach it every single week, but there are some things about Christmas that I think are so interesting that have been placed into, like, the biblical Christmas story or even, like, the cultural milieu around Christmas, and we're like, wait a second, where did that come from yeah um and so i'll go ahead let's do let's do a disclaimer um this will probably mess up some of your christmas stuff (laughs) (laughs) this will probably mess up a couple major scenes a couple things and thoughts and beliefs that you've had maybe for a long time unless you've been around southridge um and listening to the teaching here for a while which we we try to do our best to to help call out some of the things that are misnomers or um, not quite right that we have traditionally believed. So, yeah, we'll go ahead and give you a, your Christmas trigger warning. Yeah, that we're gonna uh, discuss some stuff that might challenge you a little bit. Not yeah. that I think any of this stuff is like super yeah. big deals. We're just gonna have some fun with it today, though. Yeah, just hit the pause button and you can listen to this on December twenty sixth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you'll have a year to process. Yeah, it. you have you have three hundred sixty four days just to kind of come <laughs> to terms with what we're talking about today. So, um, the first question I've got for you is: Christmas, the most important Christian holiday? Oh man, I I'm gonna have to say, I don't know. I, I really don't know because. My initial instinct is to always go Easter is the Super Bowl for Christians. Like, it's the main deal. Yeah. But without Christmas, there's no Easter. Yeah. Like, you know, Jesus got to be born before he can die and raise again. <laughs> um, and both, both of those major Christian holidays have such um, importance theologically. Like, we talked about the the importance of the virgin birth a couple weeks ago on a Sunday. Yep. And like it's not like that's just like this nice little 
thing that Matthew and Luke added to the story to be like, oh, Jesus is so special. Yeah. Um, Mary was a good girl. Or, like, it's not that. Like, there's actually, like, theology around the virgin birth that really, really matters. Yeah. And so it's hard to say that Easter is more important than Christmas. I'm going to put them both on the same level because you really, if you have one without the other, you have nothing, to be honest. Correct. You have to have the virgin birth. You have to have Jesus fully human, fully God. You have to have him not born of an earthly father so he can have this sinless nature and you know you have to have that but on the other side easter is a huge deal you have to have the death that that makes the way for sins to be forgiven you have to have the resurrection which is our pathway into new life in christ and ultimately into the new creation yeah um you know for for all time and so one without the other just doesn't work um i i think celebration wise um, it seems to me that Christians probably celebrate longer and more intensely around the month of December mm-hmm. as Christ's birth, whereas Easter normally gets like an egg hunt and, you know, one big service. Whereas like here at Christmas, we've been doing a month worth of services yeah. playing Christmas music. Our church is decorated for like five weeks, so kids programs. Yeah, kids program. So it's really interesting, though. Though these two things are both very important, it does seem like Christian tradition is that we're celebrating one, you know, more than the other. And, and that, with that being said, Christmas and Easter are something that the Christians celebrate fifty-two weeks a year, yeah. three hundred sixty-five days a year, because everything that we are and everything that we have, everything we believe, everything like that, is because of Christmas and Easter. So that's like. You know, we always do this every year when we talk about what songs are we going to sing during Christmas. Yep. And it's like, there's certain things that we call Christmas music. And it's like, well, if it's about Jesus, it's actually Christmas music. So we actually sing Christmas music 52 weeks a year. Yep. Um, And so, yeah, I don't know. It seems like Christmas does get a bigger play in church. It is a time also, I think, that more people that are not normal church folks um, are interested or willing to go to church, which I think that's why the church does does that, just makes it a big deal because they know that it's a time of year where people are more generous, they're thinking about others. They're, you know... And, and honestly, the whole holiday of Christmas is about Jesus. There's no other explanation of it. Like, like even secular folks that are hanging trees and having gifts... And dinner on the 25th they know that the reason why they're doing that is because there are people in the world that believe that that you know that believe in jesus and who he was and so everything about the the holiday of christmas whether you're secular or christian or anything like that is about jesus and so i think it's a good thing that that um for a whole month whether or not the world likes it or not the focus is on Jesus, even though, you know, we try to replace it with other stuff. At the end of the day, we know Christmas is about Jesus. That's that's for secular folks. I was watching a show. Um, oh, the Great British Baking Show, which I think that you're starting to get into. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm on the second season. I've kind of, It's kind of slowed down a little bit. Yeah. Um, just I'm, like my sweet tooth is just I feel like I'm losing it or something like I'm not eating as much sweets. So I'm not like constantly craving any any uh, this is like total rabbit trail but i'm like i'm on this uh the amari gushan guishan or whatever he's got a show on netflix mm. and it's called like the great i don't know what it's called it's like some chocolate where the people sculpt like chocolate oh, it's yeah. a competition like that so that's what i'm into right now but yes i do know what you're talking yeah, about yeah so we were watching the new um Sorry holiday <laughs> version of that um we were watching the new holiday version of that that is a totally secular show from a very secular country yeah um i mean here in America, we think, you know, oh, we're, you know, we're post-Christian or whatnot. It's like, yeah, but Europe beat us to it. They've been they've been at this for a while. Mm-hmm. And even in the introduction of this, not a, you know, very secular show from a very secular country, the introduction said that the whole holiday is about a baby being born. Like, yeah. So even secular people go like, whether or not I believe Jesus is who he says he is, whether or not any of this has anything to do with my life outside of this one day of the year, we all know that that Christmas is about Jesus. Yeah. It's just like that that's what it is. So 
I like that the church does such a big deal about it and that the, the culture is so big about it because whether or not they like it, it's about Jesus. From beginning to end, it's about Jesus. Whether they are celebrating it for that purpose or not, that's what it is. Yeah. I think one of the things, kind of backtracking just a little bit, why Easter uh, is not as celebrated uh, as Christmas is, is because I think for a lot of people, like the first time that we start to have it on our radar is whenever we have Good Friday. Yeah. Uh, You know, the triumphant entry and Jesus riding on the donkey and people laying down the palm branches. Um, And I think that... that begins to 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 have that it puts Easter on the radar of most Christians. Yeah, Palm Sunday being the Sunday before. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why Easter is harder too for a lot of people, and it doesn't get its whole month worth of celebration, is because it changes every year. Yeah, it's actually just based on certain things that I, I guess in church history. This is not one of my my strong suits, but somewhere along church history, they were like, "Here's how we're going to decide when Easter is," and it's always a revolving date. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I guess it gets pushed up into March. Sometimes it gets pushed up or pushed back into April. Yeah. And so like no one really know like it doesn't get its month. Like December twenty fifth is always going to be um, December twenty fifth. December twenty fifth. <laughs> it's always going to be Christmas. Yeah. Whereas Easter moves, so it's hard to be like in March we're going to do a whole Easter month because next year it could be April or whatnot. But yeah, like I said earlier, we're always singing about the resurrection. We're always singing about the cross because those are central parts of our faith. Yeah. Now was Jesus born on December 25th? Uh no. No. And I think, you know, I think that most people have have, have accepted that. Yeah, come to terms um, with just, it. Okay, so what happened like it, at some point in church history there was this um heresy that began to pop up that Jesus wasn't a real person or or whatnot and um what what the early church like so it became really important to celebrate the human side of Jesus like mm-hmm. hey he was actually born and so to be able to do that just like we would celebrate you or me he had to have a birth date yeah and so they chose December 25th and if you read about this there's not really consensus on why they chose December 25th it depends on how you want to look at the origins of Christmas so there's a lot of people especially like the, the, the Puritan m- movement um, that came after the Reformation, they hated Christmas. They yeah. absolutely hated Christmas because they thought it was a pagan holiday um, because of things that were going on in the Roman Empire um, in the you know the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century. There's a winter solstice festival in December that culminates on December the 25th um, called Saturnalia. There's another one called Dies Natalis Solus Invicti, which is a December 25th festival um, for the sun uh, for the honored sun god. And so there was these things, and so it looked like when the Christians did this that they were pagan, like celebrating a, a pagan holiday. And it actually Christmas was a really, um, especially in the the mid m- Middle Ages and stuff, was like a raucous type holiday where it was almost more like Mardi Gras. People wow. would it would debauchery, drinking, all of this sort of stuff. Um, but the whole December twenty fifth thing, I read some really interesting things as to how we got there. Um, some of them believe that it was the the church trying to um, Christianize these pagan festivals, um, like saying, "Okay, you're already feasting on December twenty fifth. We're going to make this Jesus's birthday um, type deal." So it was almost like they were trying to. It's almost a lot like um, All Saints Day. Um, mm-hmm. Or or All Hallows Eve, you know October thirty first. Everyone says, "Oh, that has pagan, um, you know." So it's like, yeah. But what the church was trying to do was trying to replace the paganism of it with something Christian. So when we say it has pagan roots, it, I I don't really see it like that. Now I read one article today from the Gospel Coalition that says the idea that that it has anything to do with those pagan roots is completely false that for over a thousand years no one tied these two things together it wasn't until like the 1200s yeah that someone was writing and was like oh did you, you know you see this connection or whatever so i think you could see it many different ways now one of the really interesting things i saw let me find my notes on it. i actually had to do research for this guys because <laughs> holidays and stuff are I, like like two weeks ago i was able to talk about the bible um, yeah. I'm pretty well versed in a lot of that sort of stuff, even though as even after I read that back, I was like, oh, I wish I would have said some 
things different. This is one of those things when I saw the list of questions, I'm like, I'm going to have to do some research because I know some of it and I could give my opinion, but I wanted to try to be as helpful well, as possible. But there was this thing mo- I found. Most okay. of the time, most of the time, uh, the the questions that are that are asked on the podcast like I, it's just the day of like the first time you hear it is yeah. on the podcast and i was like uh we should probably forward these and like just let him kind of stew over it just a little bit so we're uh, a little bit more prepared in our questions um just yeah. for the podcast you know instead of just trying to guess at things and yeah and we want to do our due diligence and make sure that we're presenting uh correct information for you all that are listening or yeah. watching and what, so one of the things that popped up when i was studying this about is why is christmas on december 25th why do we celebrate it there i saw this thing that said there was multiple places in the world that pointed to march 25th as being the date of jesus's death and then there began to be this thought, but they were happening independently of one another. So it wasn't like there's this thought and everyone starts building on it. It was happening in two different places. And so, like, as people are looking at it, they're like, maybe there's something to this. Mm-hmm. Like, this sounds like pure speculation to me. Um, totally. So I will go ahead and make sure that, make sure that you all understand that. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm this isn't in the Bible. This isn't like everyone agrees with this. This is just something that I read that I thought was really interesting. There began this belief in the early church at some point that Jesus died on March the 25th, um, which is plausible given the fact that that was when uh, Passover was and whatnot. So it would have been in that season. Gotcha. Now, the Eastern Orthodox Church holds that as April the 6th, which, interestingly enough, Eastern Orthodox Church celebrates Christmas on January the 6th and not de- uh, uh, December 25th. Um, but... What happens is what happened was they they pinpointed that date of when they believed Jesus was was um, uh, killed. I think it was killed or the resurrection. Let me see. It says death here, so unless I wrote that down wrong, they believe that he was crucified on the, on March the twenty fifth mm-hmm. um, of the year that he died. Now, what they the belief began to be that they believed that he was conceived on the same day of the month that he was killed. Um. So they believe that he was conceived on March 25th. Gotcha. Um, I think that's what it was. And so because they 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 had that kind of mindset that he was conceived at this point, then they went nine months into the future and 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 put it on 12:25. Gotcha. I don't know if any of that makes any sense. To be honest, I don't know. It's it's clearly not like in the scriptures or whatnot. It is kind of interesting. But so for for some people, they believe the death and conception was March, um, March twenty fifth or April the sixth, and then they go nine months into the future for that. It I don't know. I um, I may have even wrote that down wrong. I'm trying to figure out why um, they're believing the birth was in December when they know that it wasn't in December, um, because it would have most likely been in the spring or in the fall because. Um, of the time that they that they typically did uh, census, correct? Well, between that, but the big the one of the big contextual clues in the the biblical story is that the shepherds were out in the fields with their sheep, which they they didn't they wouldn't have done that in December. Yeah, it was too cold. Um, it was way too cold. Um, so it's more likely that the shepherds were out in the field with their sheep, probably sometime between spring and fall. It was at nighttime um, too, correct? Yeah. Which means it would have been a heck of a lot colder if it was in December because, you know, obviously at nighttime in the winter, it yeah, gets so they're drastically thinking, colder. So I, I, that that's some of the December 25th stuff. Was Jesus born on December 25th? Nobody really knows. What, the, is it tied to these pagan holidays? Maybe. Maybe it was a replacement for them. It was like mm-hmm. a Christianized version of them. And, and, and for folks that are like, oh, is, Christmas is so pagan with the trees and the gifts and the consumerism and all that. It's like... Look, I get it, but like I said earlier, the whole the whole thing's about Jesus. Um, whether people like have bad motive in it and have bad practice in it or whatnot, at the end of the day, it's about Jesus. The reason our family gives gifts is because Jesus is a gift yep. to, to all of us. And so it's a reminder that he was generous to us for God so loved the world that he gave. And so we give gifts. I don't see anything unchristian about giving gifts yeah. to people. I don't see anything unchristian about receiving gifts. Either because every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. That's from from James. I don't see any issue with with that. I don't see any issue with the tree. 
you want to decorate and everyone's like, oh, those are pagan symbols. It's like, no. I mean, one of the most important symbols in the Christian um, worldview is a tree. Yeah. It's it's the cross. Yep. It, it's a, you know, so um, I remember Kirk Cameron actually had a really good movie called Saving Christmas. I say really good. I know most people will find it cheesy. He actually went over a lot of the this stuff as far as what the tree meant, where it came from, why why he believes, you know, it's it's a a, a good Christian thing um, to to still hold on to that that movie Saving Christmas. You can normally find it on the streaming platforms this time of year. Um, but yeah, no matter whether or not it was December twenty fifth, which I doubt it was when it was, we know that Jesus of Nazareth was born. Yeah, um, and because of that, I mean, they have literally. Div- tried to divide history based on when this baby was born. Yeah. That's where BC, AD, that's where all that comes from, even though they screwed that up and they got it wrong. Um, and, never, you know, that, that's zero or one B, uh, AD or whatever. That's not when Jesus was born. They We all know that. that yeah. They messed that up by about four, uh, four to six years or so. So Jesus was actually probably born... Um, yeah, between six and four BC, and not closer to that, which puts his death closer to like thirty AD rather than like thirty three or thirty five or thirty six, which some people believe. Um, but none of none of those details matter. Yeah, like because we do know that Jesus was born, and that, that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever said uh, "Happy Birthday" to Jesus? I'm sure I have. Yeah. I'm I, sure I have. Uh, I don't have an issue with it. I actually like a couple of years ago in our kids' ministry, we sent home "Happy Birthday Jesus" like packets with people. Like it had a cake mix in it for you to make Jesus a birthday cake or whatever. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if it's the like honestly, as, as a person that has been born and has a birthday, if y'all chose to celebrate my birthday on a different day of the year, I wouldn't care as long as there was a day that you celebrated <laughs> my birthday. You know, that I could get some cake that's yeah. dedicated for me. Yeah, as long as there's a day that you're going to make mo- <laughs> um, make much of the day that I was born and be happy for it, that's great. I have a feeling that's how Jesus feels. I don't feel like he's going, well, that's not right. Yeah. You know, I think he's just pleased that there's a day that recognizes his birth. And, in fact, there's about a whole month or for some people – my mom, she buys Christmas gifts all year long. Yeah. She's just stacking them up all year long. Yeah. So there's some people that are literally thinking about Christmas all year long, and it's all about Jesus. And I know critical people will be like, well, presents aren't about Jesus. Christmas ain't about presents. Well, I mean, let's just agree to disagree on that because I think pres- the presents we give actually is a really good picture of Jesus. Correct. Yeah. Now, yeah. do we get overboard with it? For sure. Yes. Are there really unhealthy balances sometimes and people go into debt and all this? I'm not saying that. Yeah. Like, do what's within your means, but there's nothing inherently evil about giving some kids some toys. Correct. Or shoes or whatever it is you want to buy a kid. Or me. Well, and it also opens you up to um, this form of generosity um, that hopefully can become a lifestyle to where anybody that you come in contact with um, that genuinely needs something, then you can meet that need. You know, that's what God yeah. did for all of us with our sin. Why can't we do that with people's, um, you know, the limitations with their own resources? You know, if somebody's struggling with yeah. like hunger or something like that, why can't we just get them some food? Or yeah. if somebody you know that needs a new pair of shoes, why can't we go get them a pair of shoes? Yeah, the practice of generosity is never going to negatively affect you in your life as long as you're not being you know unwise in the first place yeah like have a budget stick to the budget i'm not saying go crazy and go into debt yeah like the practice of generosity will always um make you more like christ yeah and so so people you know folks that want to fuss and fight about gifts on christmas and stuff i just don't i don't i mean jesus was a gift to the whole world and on his birthday it makes sense that we give gifts. Yep. And when the, you know, this will lead us into possibly our next section. When the, the wise men show up yep. in the Christmas, you know, we still consider that part of the Christmas story because Jesus was so young when that all happened. What'd they do? They brought gifts. And it's, and it's butted up next to the story of his birth. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, the, like, don't be foolish, but gifts are okay. Yeah. Like, gifts are okay. I think it's a great picture 
of how generous God has been to each and every one of us. Yeah. Now, speaking on the wise men, were there only three wise men that 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 showed up and visited Jesus? Yeah, this wise man thing really, really throws people off. Yeah. Um, because we have manger scenes that we use as decorations. Yeah. That have always, for the most part, traditionally come with, you get baby Jesus, you get Mary, you get Joseph, you get some shepherds, you get some animals, you get a star, you get wise men. And camels. And camels. The problem is, there's probably no way in the history of the world that those wise men were at that original scene that the shepherds would have been at. Okay. Um, and the reason being is the wise men are not from Jerusalem. Yeah. They were from about 900 miles away, somewhere around the area of Babylon. And so given the fact that they might have traveled on camel or by foot or by donkey or whatever they came by, 900 miles at that time oh, is going to take a while. For sure. And the other contextual clue that we get as to the fact that they probably weren't at that original scene of the birth. And I say the scene of the birth because I don't like the the term manger scene because it, it throws some people off. Um, but like that first night, I don't, it's, it's highly unlikely that they made 900 miles that night. Um, and when Herod, if you remember, they show up, um, the wise men show up in Matthew chapter two, they talk to Herod. They're like, Hey, where's the newborn King of the Jews? And for Herod as the King of the Jews, he's going, wait a second. Yeah. What are you talking about? King of the, I'm the King of the Jews and my son will be the, the new King of the Jews. Yeah. Like, there, there ain't no new king of the Jews that I don't know about because they show up at the royal household yeah. because what they saw and what they interpreted through the prophecies that they were aware of was that there was going to be a new king of the Jews born. And so when he sends out this edict, because now he's like, man, somebody has been born that's going to challenge my throne. He doesn't say go find all the newborns. He directs them to go find everyone two years and below. And that's because most likely there could have been upwards of two years pass between when Jesus was born and when the wise man, wise, wise man, goodness, <laughs> wise men showed up to worship. Yeah. And so when you have your manger scene that you're decorating with, just take your wise men and put them like on a table somewhere like, else in the room like a foot away because they're part they're part of the story yeah they're just not part of that story <laughs> they just happen a little bit later and then the other thing was there only three of them yeah we don't know there was only three gifts yeah but there could have been a ton of them like it's plausible that they would have came in a large caravan if you were going to travel 900 miles with only three people you know, carrying all their stuff, regardless of if they had donkeys yeah. or whatever, you I know, mean, strapped to their animals. They probably had caravans and servants and all of this, but I mean, could there have been other wise men? Yeah, yeah. because the word wise men literally just it, it, it points to the fact that they were either like a magician or an astrologer or somebody like that. They were someone that was uh, like learned. You know, they were very educated. Yeah, that was they my next question. Really pay attention. They th these people were brilliant when it comes to interpreting what was happening in the sky at this time. Yeah. Like like unless you live in an area that like doesn't have the you know the light pollution that most places have or have mountains or trees and stuff that really affect your ability to see at nighttime. Yeah. Um then you know that that wasn't them. They didn't have those issues and so you know these folks they were very well versed in astronomy and astrology and things like that. That's why they that's why when they showed up the whole reason they showed up was they saw a star that they interpreted to mean the newborn king of the Jews has been born. Yeah. Like, so that means that, first off, they had to, that, that information had to come from somewhere. Most likely it was prophecies because these folks were from Babylon, which Babylon is the nation that overtook the Jews um, for their unfaithfulness. God let them lead them away into captivity and into exile. There was a guy named Daniel that rose to prominence in um, Babylon. Um, you know, we, we hear his story in the Old Testament, and it's very likely that the information that these folks have came from the time that, that Daniel and his friends were in power, and these Jewish prophecies would have been left 
in Babylon for these wise men to read. So they're thinking there's going to be a new um, king of the Jew. They interpret those prophecies left there all those all those years before from Daniel. But then they see what's going on in the heavens and in the sky, and they go, this must be what Daniel was talking about. This must be what they were talking about in these prophecies. And so they show up to find this newborn king of the Jews. Um, and so they did that all by interpreting the stars yeah, and what was going on in the heavens. And with this prophecy, it's mind blowing yeah. um, that, that they were able to do that. And they ended up coming to find it, but it probably took about two years is, is, is what I've heard from a lot of people. It's a very, very long 900 miles. Doesn't seem terrible to us who have flown in jet planes and on, you know, interstates we've driven and all of this but 900 miles walking or in, in, in a, a wagon yeah in a large caravan probably no, thank you probably getting stopped along the way oh yeah because of everybody knowing who they are and they're probably yeah, they're a big deal yeah. yeah um no thank you on that but but that star the whole thing about the star like I'd, I, I i've been really interested in that this year Trying to figure out, is there some sort of natural phenomenon that could explain the star? Well, a lot of people, don't they think that the North Star is, like, the star that the that the wise men used to find? I mean, you know, like, what what's the deal with the star itself? Did it, whenever yeah. it first appeared, did it initially just hang out above where Jesus was born? Or did it appear above where, in Babylon, where the wise men were? And they just started to like head in the direction yeah. of the star. Like, like, do we know enough about the star? We know that it's there and that it existed. Yeah. So I'm going to share some cool star stuff now. Okay. First, let me preface. I know nothing about astronomy whatsoever or <laughs> astrology. So if I butcher some of this, understand I am a pastor that is trained to teach the bible and not a scientist trained in astronomy or anything like that but i have read about this because it's really interesting to me yeah um and let me preface this no one knows period what the christmas star is no one knows whatsoever yeah. lots of speculation some really cool interesting things that it could be but one of the things i read this morning that i was like yeah i mean that's possible too was um you know we've talked about um couple you know the virgin birth and the fact that if the virgin birth is possible and if god can create anything that he wants and all that i mean could god show the magi uh a star to lead them to where he wants them to go mm -hmm. that maybe no one else saw is it like something supernatural is that yeah. possible yes yes but if we're looking for a natural cause there are some options so first off I like the double preface, by the way. Yeah, yeah. That was like a double, like... I'm a big double preface person because <laughs> I don't want to say something or act like an expert in areas that I'm not. And then people take it to the bank. Yeah, yeah. yeah like I don't want to see someone on Facebook later this afternoon going, did you know the Christmas star was... <laughs> No, I, no, no one knows this. They in were fact, every single article that I read and every yeah. every scholar that I've gone to goes, we don't know. But here's some cool stuff that it could have been. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. That, so that's all that this is. Um, so first off, anyone that says it was Halley's Comet, that came through around 12 to 11 BC. So that's not that's going to be too early because the birth of Christ was probably between 6 BC and 4 BC. So they ran numbers for whenever the comet usually flies by the Earth. Mm -hmm. And then just sub, like went back in in the time. Is yep. that correct? Okay. Yep. So um, and then some of them believe that it would be like a supernova mm -hmm. of, of sorts because those can last for a while and get really really bright. Um, so I saw one um, one place was really high on that, and then an astronomy website that I went to was very low on that. Yeah. <laughs> so like I said, there's not a lot of consensus around that i think <laughs> and j when it says star in the that original language it can mean a star a planet a meteor a comet or an asteroid so it can mean many different things gotcha. we translate it as star um but let me let me see some of these other things I can think you imagine my, if somebody got picked up a manger and it's just got a comet hanging out above it like yeah. a, little, a little display piece for their for their mantle yeah. and they're like I thought I was supposed to get a star, but I just got a, a little a planet or a comet or a meteor. Just yeah, it's just, just wild. Yeah. So someone else, someone else said it could have not been a supernova, but something 
just a Normal Nove or whatever. I don't fully understand all of that. Gotcha. Um, but they were saying if it was that, that there would be people that would be, if you were looking for it, like it, it, it's, it's inferred that the, the wise men were looking for this, like, the people in the east were looking for the sign in the stars, and so something could have arose in the sky for people that were looking for it mm -hmm. and not been super obvious to the people that were just hanging out doing life. Okay, that's an option. I think my favorite one, and this may be completely false, like, but this is my favorite one, is that there was three times, let me find it, Three times in AD or in uh, seven BC that there was a conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, um, a conjunction. I'm just going to read you a definition I wrote down because I don't even fully understand what this means, but y'all can get more into this. A conjunction of planets happens when two planets make close approach to each other in Earth's night sky. They're not actually near each other. They just appear to be from that vantage point. I th if I'm not mistaken, I think last December we had one of these. And, like, everyone went out and saw the planets uh, real super close. Well, it was real cloudy where because I was at. the Because the word aster can mean planet, this is plausible. And so there was three different conjunctions like that that happened in 7 BC, which is a little outside of the time frame that we think that this could have all happened. Um but it happened all in the same constellation of Pisces. Um, another conjunction happened in 3 BC. Um, and that was of Jupiter and Venus. Um, 3 BC, if it was two, if Jesus was born between six and four, that could be five. And then two years later, we could be in three. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe that's a possibility. Um, but I like the whole idea of Jupiter and Saturn because Jupiter was always the planet that was associated with kings. To some, Saturn was actually associated with people and sometimes even the people of Israel. So if it had been Jupiter and Saturn lining up, there were it, it's plausible that these folks that knew more about the stars and interpretation of it could look at it and go, we see Jupiter, the kingly planet, Saturn, the Jewish you know, emblem. We think the king of the Jews has been born yeah. and then followed it. Is, is that true? I don't know. It's cool though. Yeah, it's it's it's, like, it's, it's, it's a cool, cool take for sure. Um, I it, like it's, it. It's the one that gets me the most excited. But like like I said, I just I have no clue at all if that's even true. But we do know that it, like Jesus had to be born between six and four BC, and so it had to be something in that time frame. And and, and like and the reason why Jesus had to be born between that is because Herod the Great is mentioned as being. In power when Jesus is born, and history knows Herod the Great died in 4 BC. Yeah. So 4 BC is the absolute earliest Jesus could have been born, or else the Gospels didn't get it right. And we know that they did, um, especially Luke, because Luke was a fantastic historian. He got over 80 archeo archaeological and political references right in the book of Acts. And so there's no reason to think back into the book of Luke that he wouldn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. So that, that I think, is. Um, the one that gets me the most excited about the star, but honestly where I started and I started thinking about this, could God have just sent, sent something that only these guys saw? Yeah. It's not out of the realm of possibility because nothing is when we're dealing with supernatural. Yeah. When we're, do when we're dealing with God, if he wants to show me something that he doesn't show anyone else, he, that's his prerogative. He's allowed to do that. Um, and, and then how that gets passed on to Matthew to put into the story. Who know, You know, that's that's all through these firsthand accounts and whatnot. But... Um, Would your star be like a stack of pancakes or something? Yeah. You know, yeah. because if like... If God the, was directing me somewhere, it would definitely have something to do with breakfast food. <laughs> some, some pancakes and some bacon. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah. interesting... Um, the, the biblical narrative does say that they followed the star, so it sounds to me like the... This star, or whatever it is, moved. Yeah, but then, like the more rational side of me is like, I'm pretty sure if I looked at the same star and kept walking, it would look like it was always moving. Correct. Until well, I got to the point that I was actually right under it. Yeah. So, was it up in the sky or did it start over, you know, in the east and follow them? I think maybe I, I may not know enough about astronomy. I could be way off base. They're like, no, that's not possible. But it seems to me like, you know, it could be either one. I or just the rotation of the Earth, because the constellations, from our perspective, yeah. move. 
you know, whenever they're just staying still and we are the ones that are moving. Yeah. So it could have been something along those lines, you know, but like, like you said, it's all purely speculation. Yeah. So nobody literally like, they don't think it was a meteor because those are so fast. Like you couldn't follow it. But it for sure wasn't sitting on top, Um, like, like right on top of the manger. Like most things are depicted. No, this was up in the sky. Uh, I'm guessing just based on the biblical narrative of it, but yeah, those are some options that we have. I don't know. I, I, the more I think of it, I think I lean more towards the supernatural um, option of maybe this was something that, that just they saw mm-hmm. um, or they were the only ones really looking for it. Yeah. And it was there, but no one else really saw it or something like that. But yeah. that's the deal with the star. I mean, something happened to get these men to Jesus, which is the important part. Like, I think sometimes we get caught up in the details because they're fun. Like, oh, Saturn and Jupiter did this, and they, this yeah. could mean this, this could mean that. That's fun. But the important thing is somehow or another, these folks that found out this prophecy because Daniel was in captivity at one point in their country yep. have come and come to worship Jesus. That's the important part of the story. Yeah. So what about like manger scenes? We kind of touched a little bit on it. Was it just like a couple of logs like held together? Um, and then obviously, you know, like whenever we look at manger scenes that are like, you know, used as decoration or whatever, it's usually just like four post, some kind of like shanty style, yeah. like building. Um, and, you know, like what what what's up with the manger and and like, do we know exactly what it looked like or, you know, just the whole the whole scene, I should say? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. The traditional view of the manger is way off base. Um, it's always some sort of freestanding structure. Yeah. Um, that housed animals or whatnot. This is this is just not the way that it would have been at all. Um I, I, I've been in Christmas plays also. This is all wrapped up in the same thing. I've been in Christmas plays and seen Christmas plays where as Mary and Joseph come to Jer- uh, come to uh, Bethlehem, they're looking for a place to stay. Yeah. And they're always going to hotels, mm-hmm. motels. This is not an accurate way of looking at what, what took place yeah. at all. If you were coming, everyone had to go back to their hometown to register. Yeah. Who lives in your hometown? Your family. Your family. Mm -hmm. Yes. The word um, that's translated as in is the word cataluma, which elsewhere in the New Testament is um, spoken of as guest room. So what happened was if the whole family had to come into the town and everyone, all the Jews for the most part, unless you were part of the high class, they were poor. Yeah. So you've got all your family coming in. You're poor. You don't have the biggest living space. If Mary and Joseph were the last ones to show up, there's no room for them, not in the inn, but in the guest room. Yeah. And so the, from there, once we can remove the myth of the innkeeper, and if you do a Christmas play about an innkeeper that didn't have any room in his heart for Jesus, <laughs> I shake my head at that. <laughs> <laughs> there's no innkeeper. There's no inn mentioned. It's, it's guest room. Um, so there's two options from there that we could go. What did, what was this manger scene really looked like? Yeah. Um, first the manger is a animal feeding trough, probably carved out of, uh, stone and not wood. Yeah. Not like a little, like the little a frame or the X frame. We make mangers to look like that mainly because most of us don't know how to work with stone. Yeah. Like it's, it's easier to put some wood together and that's like an iconic Christian image, this yeah. wooden manger. But like that's not, not at all what you would have been looking at. You would have been looking for a feeding trough, like hewn out of stone. Yeah. Well, you got to think of like okay, it's just kind of focus on this concept just a little bit. So if you know anything about wood, it is obviously extremely porous and does not do well in moisture. Yeah. And so there wasn't like pressure treated wood like we have now, like to put up fence and then it stays up for up there for 30 years and then it lasts through all the elements. So you got all these animals eating out of this wooden trough. It have it, it would have rotted really quick just because of the yeah. saliva coming from these animals mouths. Yeah. So probably not made of wood. But so the two options of where this manger, this, you know, stone animal dish 
would have been found was, first off, it could have been, since there was no room in the family's house, there was no guest room or anything like that available, on the first floor of the family house is where, at wintertime, they would have brought in the animals, and so it's likely that they could have been there, Mm -hmm. and there would have been the stone manger there. And so they could have been just on the first floor of a family home, but that's not where anyone else slept. This is where they would bring the animals in to keep them warm during um, the cold time. That's one option. The other option that that's I've if seen, Jesus got born during the cold time. Remember yeah. our conversation earlier. So yep. the other option is that um, because the, the, the key is the manger. We know it's an animal feeding trough. So we have to get our clues from the fact that there was probably animals. The other place where animals would have been kept um, at nighttime or whatnot would have been in a cave. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this could have been done all in a cave. Um, so either the first floor of their family house that was not necessarily a living quarters but housed animals or a cave is a much more accurate depiction of the scenery surrounding Jesus when he was born. And so I know between the wise men and the wooden manger, and we say manger, that's the manger is the thing that was holding Jesus not the actual structure correct around it that's why i said manger scene it's like yes manger meaning animal feeding dish and not this structure that is built up around it so now that i've destroyed all of your christmas decorations <laughs> i'm sorry i mean the 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 you know your intent is good behind it we told you to wait till jesus <laughs> we told you to wait till the 26th to listen <laughs> yeah but it's just you know we th- this is um symptomatic though of what the church does historically yeah um we we don't fully understand the scriptures and so therefore we pick up some things along the way that upon second look or third look you start going wait a second this isn't accurate or the more that we learn about the first century or the world that was existed at that point then we start going okay i think that we've gotten some of this wrong now, does it matter if your manger scene has wise men at it? No. Does it matter if it's a wooden feeding trough? No. Like I said, none of this is actually like big deals. It's just, yeah, it's fun for me to talk about some of the misconceptions and how we've gotten where we are with all of this. Yeah. Now, um, does the Bible ever mention anything about a drummer boy? coming i so badly wish uh, (laughs) there is such a great thing on facebook going around right now about like right after mary gets the baby down some uh kid shows up it's like i'll tell you what that lady needs a drum solo (laughs) i love like i don't know where that song came from yeah um i don't know why the ox and lamb have rhythm at all but it's i like that song yeah but no, no, no drummer boys. I, I would love to know more about that song. I think it was just more of like a poetic stance and just yeah. saying, look, I don't have much to offer except for like my talents. And like, like I'm, I'm bringing it to you, Jesus. Yeah, and I can wake your child up right now. Yeah. And you will be frustrated with me at least for the next 24 hours thinking, where did this kid with this random drum come from? Yeah. I, so I don't, I don't understand the whole drummer boy thing, even though I think it might be my favorite Christmas song outside of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is my favorite. Yeah. Now, uh, did Jesus come to bring peace on earth and goodwill towards men? Yes. Yeah, he he came to bring peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And I know that people look at the world now and they go, well, that doesn't seem like it's actually happening, but that's because you live in 2021 and not in the first century. Um, the you know right now is the greatest time in human history to ever be alive. Yep, you have wider access to education and health care than ever before. Um, you have you know social programs in place for the poor to be taken care of in different ways. We have very educated people that are advancing us in technology and in medicine and in all of these different things. It's the best time ever. Yeah. And so when we say that the world's not a very peaceful place right now, it's like, yeah, but you don't know what it was like to live in the first century under Roman rule where any 
time that you stepped out of line, you could be nailed to a cross. I, last time I checked, I, I, I wasn't driving down 64 and seeing miles worth of naked people hanging on crosses. Yeah. So when people go, uh, I don't know that Jesus came to bring peace. He did come to bring peace. Um, but that doesn't always mean national or like political type peace either. I think the main type of peace that Jesus brought the message of Christmas was that he came to bring peace between humanity and God. Mm -hmm. Um, Because as you, as you read the scriptures, it becomes obvious, even though like no one likes to say it in such harsh terms. If you're not with God, you are his enemy. You are an op, you know, you are obstinate to him. You are his enemy. He is your enemy. You are on Satan's side if you're not on God's side. No one says it like that because everyone wants to think that we're good people or whatnot. Um, but no, that's the truth. So what he came to do was to put an end to the war between God and humanity that was caused because of sin. He came to put an end to that the way you and I wouldn't have to pay you know, any sort of penalty or feel the, you know, you know, have the consequences of that sin that we have committed eternally. So when it says that he came to bring peace, he came to bring peace between us and God because we were enemies. Yeah. We were, we were at odds with God and Jesus came to be the perfect mediator between us, humanity and God. So yes, he brought peace. He brings goodwill through the blessing of what he did. Yeah. Um, so is the world perfect right now? No, but think about, I mean, how far it's come in 2,000 years. Yeah. And, and a lot of these advances that I mentioned, medicine, science, mathematics. Transportation. Um, all of this. <laughs> all of this has been led mm-hmm. no, like mainly by Christians. Yeah. Christians who believe there is a God and if there's a God, then, then we can figure this stuff out because there's a intelligent mind behind everything, which means there's a pattern to it. There's a, there's, a, there's reason behind it. And so therefore we can learn this. That's the process of science. And then we can go and we can like, we know gravity is always going to happen. We learn that. So now we can use that to our benefit in different ways. And so a lot of the, these advances that have made the world so fantastic actually were led early on by Christians because they believed that the world was predictable. Yeah. That they could figure it out because they did believe that the creator made it in such a way. Now you got quite a bit of notes there. Is there anything in your notes that we may have missed in our questions that you want to talk about? All right. Let me move the microphone and check. Cause I cannot see. I don't know how people on other podcasts do this. I always got, see them with you, notes. You got to look through like your right eye, like just one eye. All right. Let's see what I got. Don't forget, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we do have our our Christmas Eve service tonight at 3 p.m. You're more than welcome to join us uh, either in person or on our live stream. Uh, We'll be live there as well. It's going to be an incredible, incredible night that we're having tonight. So here's I've got some really cool Christmas stuff that I think will help um lighten the mood a little bit away from some of this other stuff but uh, i'm going to like quiz you you're gonna quiz me on this yeah it'll be fun all right see you didn't if, give me the questions ahead of time i know though. but i'm gonna see if you know any of this all right just like a little christmas trivia so do you know what uh country saint nicholas was originally from because okay before we, santa claus is based off of a real human being yeah that lived his name was saint nicholas he lived in 280 a.d do you know what country he was from germany no no you want another guess am i close um we eat this sometimes at christmas turkey yes very good saint nicholas was from Turkey. He lived in 280 AD. I was about he, to say Hamburg, but I was like, that's in Germany too. <laughs> that's from that uh, Christmas movie because they are in Germany. I'm pretty sure they're in. Uh, that's so funny. Yeah. But St. Nicholas actually gave away his wealth and traveled the countryside helping the poor and the sick and became um, synonymous with being the protector of children and sailors. I'm not sure how the sailors thing came into it. But that's where the whole idea of old St. Nick or Santa Claus came from. And then late in the 18th century in America, 
the Dutch that had immigrated over to America um, celebrated the anniversary of uh, Saint Nicholas, or it, you know, a shorthand of that is Center Class, which is where we get our terminology of Santa Claus. Yeah. Um, and then oh, I like this one. I'm gonna see if you can get this. All I right. bet you can. Then in 1822, an Episcopal, a, an Episcopal minister named clement clark moore penned a poem called the an account of a visit from saint nicholas which is known today as what a christmas carol try one more time an account of a visit from saint nicholas an account of a visit saint nicholas so it was the night before christmas yes that which one. now goes. what was i thinking i was thinking about the stinking ghost well i was reading today the christmas carol by charles dickens and one That's of, right. there was another uh, story or mo- something that came out around that same time that helped like revive um, Christmas, yeah. um, you know, as this good uh, holiday to be spent with family and goodwill and all of this. But like, it was actually like very socially, um, like Dickens's A Christmas Carol actually served a good social purpose in repurposing christmas and refocusing christmas which was really interesting but yeah so it was the night before christmas started out as a poem by a episcopal minister named clement clark moore and now right. we know it as twas the night before christmas i don't know I, I knew charles dickens wrote the christmas carol yep and then 1881 there was a cartoonist named thomas nast who gave us the current image that we have Big white beard, red and white suit, all of that, of Santa Claus. Yeah. But he used um, Clement Clark Moore's poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas, as his inspiration of that. So it was actually in 1881 when Santa Claus takes his form. Um, So, all right, here we go. Rapid fire Christmas trivia of my random facts. (laughs) All right. How many million real Christmas trees do you think are sold every year in the U.S. Oh, goodness. I, I, I'm trying to think of, like, the statistics that we talked about with, like, how many turkeys were eaten, like, on our <laughs> Thanksgiving episode. So there's, what, 330 million people in the United States, 330, roughly? Yeah, 330, roughly around there. And they said, like, for th- the Thanksgiving, like, they said probably about 40, I think it was 40 to 45 million turkeys were eaten every year. So I'm thinking 40 to 45 million Christmas trees. Real trees. But I also have to put in a fact that that like Thanksgiving turkeys, there's no fake Thanksgiving turkeys. Yeah. So I think that that number is a lot lower. Yeah. So I would imagine that real Christmas trees, probably around 10 to 12 million Christmas trees. Ready for this? Yeah. 30 to 35 million real trees are sold every year in the U.S. Goodness. That's, come, yeah, that's a lot more than I'm There are 21,000 tree farms, like people that grow trees throughout the United States. How many years do you think the average tree has to grow before it's sold? Anywhere between 15 to 25 years. You nailed it. 15. Yeah. 15 years before it grows. Now, the reason why they think, okay, so uh, I, I do some woodworking on the side. So the reason why they can allow that to happen, usually stuff that's like built for homes has to grow a lot longer because it's got a lot more internal rings. So mm-hmm. it, like if you're building a house or a structure out of wood, the more internal rings that you have on the wood, the stronger that wood is. Yeah. And if you're only using it for like a month, a month and a half out of the year, it doesn't matter. The tree doesn't have to mature. So yeah. that's why you can get away with it being nice. so young. All right, what year did Christmas become a federal holiday? Ooh, my goodness. How long have we had it? This is in the United States, by the in way. In the United States. A federal holiday? I don't know, 1820s, 1830s. June 26th, 1870. 1870. 1870. That's, a, that's like 100 years after, uh, close to 100 years after the, yeah. the Declaration of so Independence. That's, that's when it became a federal holiday. Do you know who the first person to taste eggnog was? Oh, man. I love eggnog. I don't care. Well, I'm whoever yeah. invented it. I want to like if they did. This person didn't invent it, from what I could tell. But they were the first, apparently, to drink it. I don't know how anyone knows that, but 
That's what history.com says. Even the guy that invented it didn't taste it first? Like, there's this... <laughs> I don't know. They said Captain John Smith in 1607 was the first person to drink eggnog. Well, thank you, John Smith, like, for for taking one for the team and letting the world know of this delicious never beverage. Had never had it? Never had it. Is it just because of the name? Yeah, I, I'm not interested in that. Do you like, like milkshakes? Yeah. So... It's it's not like as thick as a milkshake, but it's thick. And I'll it's, try it this year. I'm a, I'm a, actually as soon as we're done recording, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go to uh, Kroger because I saw some uh, at the Kroger right down the road. Mm. I'm gonna go pick some up and you'll try it. It's okay. So it's got like Is it hot or cold? Cold. Cold. Yeah. Most people put alcohol in it, but you know I don't obviously. But uh, it's oh man, I don't know what it is. It is just it is heaven. It's what is, heaven. What. Like so, it's made from eggs, though. I'm guessing, right? Like, is it very eggy? I don't know. No, I don't know. It tastes delicious. What's called That's that. what yeah. it is. Well, either way, Captain John Smith in 1607. Well, where does the nog come from? I don't know. <laughs> that that I think is a word for a drink, but I could be totally wrong. All right, next one. Do you know what country poinsettias were brought to America from? Oh man. Uh, I'll give you a hint if I'm not mistaken. It's in the Middle the East. The red and green of the poinsettia is actually present in the flag of this country. I don't know. How, I want to say somewhere in the Middle East. Because don't they do all the tulips and stuff like that out in the mil- Middle East? I have no idea. This is about the only thing I know about plants. Yeah. And it's only because it's in front of me. Yeah, I have no idea. Poinsettias were named for Joel R. Poinsett, who was a minister to Mexico. Who Mexico? It, yeah, and he brought it to the America, uh, to uh, to America in 1828. Well, add that to the contribution list that I never knew, because <laughs> I yes. always just thought, hey, they've got like some of the nicest people and some of the best food ever. Yep. Poinsettias so. <laughs> originally, I guess, came from Mexico. That's what all of this is from history.com as well. And so if I'm wrong, they're wrong. So, yeah, I'm just going to put that out there. All right. The Salvation Army has been sending out their Santa ringers since when? Ooh, since the 20s. 1890s. 1890s. All right. That's not too far off. I missed it by 30 years. All right. Here we go. Robert L. May, in 1939, wrote a poem to lure customers to Montgomery Ward Department Store. The poem, he created a fictional character. Who do you think that fictional character was? Rudolph. You nailed it. Really? Yeah. Rudolph was apparently, according to History.com, was written as a poem to, to get people to shop at Montgomery Ward, which... I think Montgomery Ward might have even been closed by the time I even remember shopping. So for yeah. anyone that's younger listening, you're going to have no clue what Montgomery Ward is. No. But apparently it was a big department store that used to be pretty big for Christmas. Yeah. Well, my, you know, our kids are not going to know what Sears was. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's so crazy to think about. My grandma worked at Sears. Yeah. And, like, our kids aren't even going to know what it is. You know, in 2008, they I was – Gosh, I, I watch all kind of informational. Yeah. So, sit, little side note: two thousand and eight uh, or two thousand and nine or something. I think it was one of those. It was it was the it was the, a year or two after the recession in two thousand and eight. Sears like charted like in their sales, it was like fifty nine billion dollars in sales. Not but a few years later, like they had like it just drastically went down from there. Just like in fifty nine billion to pretty much out bankrupt. of business now. Bankrupt. bankrupt. Wow. I think they have like maybe like Sears like scratch and dent stores every once in a while. Wow. I mean, if they have maybe ten just holding on, then I don't know. That's wild. Yeah, it is crazy. Wow. All right, final one. Construction workers started the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree in what year? Ooh, I knew that it. I know that the Christmas tree wasn't always as big as it used to be. It used to be a lot smaller. Um. The Rockefeller Christmas Tree Center. Which is absolutely beautiful if you've never seen it in person. It's awesome. I've never seen it. I've seen horror and stories the, about the ice skating rink in front oh, of yeah, it. The, like, the ice skating rink is pretty awesome. 
Well, I've like most of the pictures that I see are like terrible ones where like people are like trying to skate through like well, two inches get of all, water. Yeah, you get all well, you get all these people. Um, you know, New York is such a tourist hotspot. You get oh, yeah, all yeah. these people from all over the place. Most of them have never ice skated before, <laughs> but they want to ice skate. Yeah, I, I could see it. it. It could be dangerous. But yeah, 1931. 1931. But I thought it was interesting that they said construction workers were the ones that started that tradition. Oh, that is like, pretty interesting. Yeah, like uh, uh, that that was just fascinating to me. So construction workers started the that and that 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 whole little complex down there at Christmas time is absolutely fantastic. So Yeah. That's all I'm, my fun Christmas stuff. That's, that I, have. I mean, it's kind of humbling a little bit because most construction workers back in the early days, you know, of, you know, the this or the ninth, the eighth, the 20th century, um, they, uh, you know, it was just humble. Like it was paycheck to paycheck. Oh, yeah. And so for those guys just to 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 be able to put something Sprucing together. Sprucing it up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's so wild. And it's still going on. Like that just. Yeah. And it, now it's huge. Like yeah, I think it wasn't until like the fifties or the sixties that they started bringing in like the big ginormous tree oh, yeah. that they've got now. Yeah, I so I, I want to say I think one time it was, either, it was either that tree or the one at the White House. One time they got from West Virginia. I That's believe. cool. Um, because it's always a big deal, like where the tree comes from. They always publicize the Rockefeller Center and, and the yeah. White House, I believe. Um, and I think one time it was from West Virginia, and I thought that was cool. You ain't getting anything that green from Texas. That's it. I guarantee <laughs> no, you that. You're it's going gonna, gonna to look like the Charlie Brown Christmas tree, just yeah. like really bad. All right, man. So this brings us up to our mystery meet. A lot of the times we have asked questions that are completely random. You know, we've talked about superhero stuff. We've talked about our favorite foods and stuff like that. So this question is, is it's a little change of pace. What is the best thing that has happened to you since last Christmas? Oh, man. This has been such an awesome year. Like, it really has. Even though we've still been having to deal with coronavirus stuff and the mm -hmm. church is not what it used to be um, at this time, um, there's been so much. Um, I don't even think I could quantify or qualify the best thing um because i'm in every area of life i'm so thrilled with the way that this last year has gone i have new friendships and new relationships yeah um i have grown in my knowledge and in my relationship with the lord i feel especially right now over the last like six eight weeks feel like i'm at a really high point yeah and that um, you know, my kids are doing fantastic. My wife works here with me. She is starting the credentialing process to become an ordained pastor. Like I see God moving in her life. Yeah. Um, I mean, just so many things, um, since last year. Well, I, but if I have, if I'll choose one, um, outside of my family stuff that I just mentioned, um, the, I, I, I do a Bible study on Wednesday mornings with some guys. Yeah. That's been one of my favorite things I've ever done in ministry. Yeah. It's one of the most fruitful things I've ever done in ministry. Um, it really, that time of discipleship and sharing with other men and spending time with them and listening to their stories and uh, just doing, you know, trying to do life together, trying to study the Bible, trying to be the best husbands and fathers and, you know, leaders that we can be. I just, I love that time Yeah, a lot. I, I've, I've tried to focus a lot since summer on building discipleship avenues in ministry and that's been one of those things that's really been um, a blessing to me as well as my my wednesday night book club that i do here that's another one of those discipleship avenues it's just been a huge blessing yeah. to me but this past year has been you know as within a year had ups and downs but it's been such a good year i feel so blessed in so many ways so. yeah for me, it's 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 almost kind of like a, a similar uh, response. I can tell that my relationship with the Lord has gotten like so much better and so much stronger. Um, I've grown really close uh, or a lot closer to Jesus in that relationship. Um, you know, it's been awesome to see Erica um, begin this college ministry yeah. and reaching out and, and uh, putting together the the necessary pieces to be able to feed the uh, University of Charleston football team, starting a college ministry here, getting involved with the youth. Um, you know, my my middle child, Luke, he got baptized this year. Um, the worship team, I feel like we have, we've 
cross this new threshold spiritually as a team um, to where we're like all genuinely pursuing God. Uh, I'm a part of the Bible study that you mentioned on Wednesdays. I love that. I love the conversation that we we're having. And I'm just I'm so optimistic, um, probably more than I ever have been going into this next year yeah. of what God is going to do. Uh, I, we're going to see just this incredible outpouring of this, the Holy Spirit yeah. in everything that we do. And and it's just so I, I'm just humbled to be where I'm at. Yeah. I'm humbled to be doing this with the staff each and every single week. I love it. Uh, I love that uh, that people are just appreciating this podcast and the things that we talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm super appreciative of the friendships uh, that I've created um, here in West Virginia. It's just, God is just is just I, I feel His blessings and I feel His yeah. close closeness in my life more than I've ever felt ever yeah. ever ever. And I'm just I'm humbled by it. I'm humbled that He chose me to be here. I'm humbled that I get to call you my friend. Um, I'm humbled that you are just seeking God in the way that you are and leading us in this, uh, th- leading this church and, and, and opening up, like you said, new avenues for discipleship, new avenues yeah. for people to get into the word. And I mean, goodness, I mean, like if I died today, it would be a good, it would like, there would be a lot of good things, but I don't want to because yeah. I know that there's so much more on the horizon. Yeah. I know that there's so much more that God wants for us as individuals and then so much more as, that God wants for us as a church. And I'm just excited. It's so excited to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I echo all that. I forgot this past year. Yeah. I mean, Olivia got baptized. Yeah. And yeah, I love this podcast. It's been another blessing. There's another podcast getting ready to start right after the first of the year yeah as well are we so, giving a sneak peek like right now yeah those of you that are that love the southridge church podcast and um this podcast there's going to be another touch point for us starting in 2022 where every wednesday we're going to put out an episode called the extra point yeah where we're going to dive a little bit deeper on the sunday morning uh, message and we're going to open up ways for you all to submit questions about the message that way then we could even dive deeper into those and answer some questions, get some clarity. Or if there's an area that I didn't have time to go as deep as I wanted to, I can share a little bit more insight or some extra quotes that I might have cut out from my yeah. prep process or whatever. Um, so that's going to be another podcast coming out um, to just, again, it's another avenue of discipleship because that's, you know, that's just where God's leading me right now. Yeah. Um, as it, it, like helping people develop in their faith, spiritual formation, discipleship is the call of the church. Yep. Um, yes, we are to evangelize. We are to go and share the good news, and I think that we do that. But sometimes we forget the second part of the Great Commission was to teach. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded. So, yeah. so yes, we're supposed to reach them, but we're also supposed to teach them. Um, and that's kind of the season I feel like we're in right now. We're doing some reaching, which is awesome. Um, and then I want to be faithful to do that teaching as well. Yeah. It's good. Are we going to tell who's the host? Yeah, that the extra point is going to be hosted by Pastor Cheryl, um, our Next Steps pastor, because she kind of oversees all the discipleship stuff here. And then that will be mainly with me um, every Sunday that I teach. And then if there's a week that there's a guest speaker or Cheryl is speaking or whatever, we'll turn the microphone around on her and interview her or if we can get our guest speaker to stay and yeah. do an episode with us. If not, you'll kind of hear from me and Cheryl just kind of debriefing about what that guest speaker might have shared. So we should have it every single week, um, no matter who preaches, and it'll be something that will help serve um, each of you uh, that are listening uh, to just go a little deeper, be a recap, refresher of what you learned Sunday, and, uh, and you know some new insights as well. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a nice little uh, a little Christmas gift to look forward to that'll start uh, the first week of January and um, hey guys we like from seriously from all of us here at Southridge Church we want to wish you yes. and your family a very Merry Christmas um, we we love you guys thank you so much for supporting us 
for making this show a success because without you guys listening yep. and taking in this information that we talk about and learning with us and laughing with us, um, you know, it would just be all for nothing. But so yes. Merry Christmas to all of you. Um, we hope you have a wonderful time tomorrow um, with your friends and your family. And um, we are going to be having an episode next week. So, um, hey, I think that's what we should start doing is like a sneak peek what we're doing next oh, week. Oh, yeah. Well, next week it's going to be talking about New Year's. Yeah, next week with uh, Pastor Jessica. Pastor Jessica, who is a holidays fanatic. Yeah. And she has been to New York City for the ball drop, which I think y'all will probably get into that. Yeah. Um, that was quite the experience. I was there with her when that happened. Um, so she'll have some really fun stuff to talk about New Year's um, and maybe some resolution type stuff that, that yeah. they'll get into. So next week's going to be an awesome one as well. Yep. Well, we'll see you all next week. Don't forget to join us every single Friday at 8 a.m. Uh, wherever you consume podcasts, that's where you can find this and also on Facebook Live and YouTube. Once again, Merry Christmas, Merry and y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for listening in with us today. We really appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and you can also watch the video version of this on YouTube as well. All you have to do is search up the Pastor's Potluck Podcast. From all of us here, we want to say thank you, and we'll see you next week.